Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone today? What a blessing. So good to see all of you here on this uh, beautiful day um, with your beautiful chase cases here to worship our beautiful Lord. Do we have any announcements this morning? Denise? There's a, there was an anniversary party here yesterday, and they left like a big can of coleslaw. I don't even think anything's been taken out of it. Um, there's a small container of coleslaw and then a small container of spinach dip. So if anybody is interested in taking it, or, you know, I think you might have some containers in the back if you just want to take, dip some out or whatever, you know, just, maybe I'll just set it out during fellowship time. So. All right, thank you, Denise. Thank you. Joy. There's more of the uh, community here that is a Ukrainian set and is asking for uh, donations of clothes, both men, women's clothes, and infant clothes. Um, we're asking them to bring, we're asking you guys to bring them by the 22nd of the next Sunday. And the Hanna Circle will pay the clothes to get to you guys. Wonderful. All right. Everybody bring your clothes. Marla. Next Sunday is also uh, the Hannah, Hannah Circle is putting on a church-wide birthday party. So uh, we'll have 12 tables set up, and uh, each table is a month. And uh, the idea is for you to sit at your birth month table, but you can sit anywhere you want. But there will be 12 cakes, and uh, it's kind of a special fellowship. And it's also special that it's been a few years since we last did that, so um, I look forward to it. So invite friends, family, because we're going to have a lot of cake. <laughs> All right. Uh, invite friends and family anyway, because we worship a wonderful God. Um, sure. If anybody want free ferns, I have them. Come see me. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Anyone else? The uh, sign-up sheet for mowing in the back is still a little sparse, um, so uh, feel moved to mow and, uh, and sign up. We uh, can use the help. Um, if not, Glenn's going to get stuck doing it all the time, or Jeff is going to get stuck doing it all the time. You were here this week, Jeff, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, help them out. Um, if you can, by uh, signing up to, uh, to Mo. Uh, anyone else? Okay, and uh, before we move on, um, we're going to have a little uh, slideshow from the uh, mission trip to Louisiana. Um, it's just a few minutes long. Um, many of you saw it last week in the Fellowship Hall, but I thought I'd share it with all of us here this morning. So. And uh, I can narrate a little bit. Uh, there's uh, two tall bridges in Lake Charles, and it fascinated our team. So that was a shot from one of the bridges. This is the, the home of the gentleman, Lloyd, who we were uh, working with uh, that week. Um, there's uh, Richard, Mike, and Kate, who are uh, raring to go and get to work at the church where we uh, stayed. Um, there we are. Getting to work, uh, pretty thoroughly demolished the bathroom um, and uh, started the process of replacing that. It rained one day and we discovered that there was a drainage problem in the yard, so some of us uh, tried to uh, unclog his drainage pipe, <coughs> which was a very muddy job. Kate can attest to that. It, it was muddy. And uh, a lot of drywall had to be removed. Um, so uh, particularly John and Mike uh, did that work and ripped out a lot of drywall. They discovered a lot of termite damage. Uh, since the wood had gotten so wet during the hurricanes, um, wet wood is a termite's dream come true. So uh, we had to cut uh, out an entire portion of the exterior wall that was so badly damaged. Uh, there was a window and an air conditioner, right? Is there an air conditioner in that one, Mike? Yes, yes. Yes. 
And so John and Mike reframed that. We uh, got a new window for them uh, and installed that. Yes, we did take lunch breaks. <laughs> and it was hot. And the uh, carpet that had been in there almost two years after having been waterlogged was probably really moldy and stung. So we ripped the carpet up. And uh, Kate and I learned how to install uh, vinyl plank flooring. Um, Aaron, our uh, instruction supervisor, taught us how to do that. Um, and it, uh, I think it turned out quite well, um, even if I was involved in that. <laughs> there is uh, Lloyd um, admiring the new flooring and uh, posing with Kate. Lloyd was so sweet. He uh, baked cookies for us every day. Um, the siding on the outside was rotting also. So we were going to remove the bottom couple of feet of siding, uh, but the more we got into it, the more we realized all the siding on the back of the house was rotted. So it wound up all coming off. Uh, a couple of new windows were put in in the back back there also. And new, uh, more waterproof siding was uh, put up. And uh, we basically had two teams kind of working on projects, John and Mike on one, Kate and I on the other, and Richard kind of floated back and forth between us as was needed. This is some of us posing with my friend Tom. Tom and I went to college together, and he's the district superintendent in that uh, district of Louisiana, so he stopped by to see us. There's a picture of the floor finished. <coughs> And some finishing touches with the trim and trying to put Lloyd's house back together as best we could. Um, and the, the church that we stayed at had a really nice facility with uh, a big hall and rooms to sleep in, although John and I had to sleep in a shipping container, which is there on the left, that they had made into rooms. And uh, they had another one with showers in it. There was a group uh, from a uh, church in Greenwood, Mississippi, that was there all in it, no, Greenwood, Indiana, um, working down there we made friends with. Uh, we did take half a day and go down to see the Gulf of Mexico and the marshes um, and the alligators. We did eat. Um, that's John's plate of crawfish and me eating my crawfish. And uh, there we are with Lloyd and Aaron, construction supervisor. Um, and uh, we did make good friends with Lloyd. And that, I think is the end of that. So I do want to say a word about Lloyd and, uh, and the work that we did. Many of you already know this, but the week before we arrived down there, Lloyd was calling the suicide hotline. He was so hopelessly depressed because his home had been in a barely livable state for almost two years. In that time, he's had seven heart attacks. He had back surgery. Um, and things were not looking at all boy. And every time he thought there'd be help coming, something would fall through and, and it would be delayed again. So um, not only did we rehab Lloyd's house, but we help to uh, rehabilitate Lloyd's spirit too. And each one of us spent time talking with Lloyd every day, visiting with him, encouraging him, uh, praying with him, and, uh, and enjoying his gift of cookies. So um, it was a very successful mission trip. I thank you all for your support. And um, be sure to ask Kate and Mike and John um, for their experiences of that trip. Let us now open our worship with a word of prayer. Good and loving God, sovereign ruler of the universe, our king and our friend, we gather together today to be a community of faith, worshiping the one true God with our whole hearts, our whole minds, our whole selves. We pray, Lord, that your spirit be upon us in this time of worship, that we might not only encounter 
your word, that we might encounter your joy. Help us, Lord, to learn deep in our hearts and souls the truth of your abiding love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now rise and sing, This is the Day. such things, let us also enjoy all the good gifts of God, and let us enjoy the privilege of sharing what God has given us. So as the ushers come forward to receive the offering, let us rejoice and be glad in all that God has given us and in the sharing of it. share with one another all of those concerns that we carry, but also let us share with one another all of those joys that we carry. For we are one in the Spirit and one in the Lord, 
one in a community of faith, one in suffering and one in joy. Let us now share with one another. Jeff. Yeah, continued prayers for my brother Jeremy, he's back in the hospital with his pneumonia. My mom, your caretaker, has told us, so prayers for them too. It's always something, so we will continue to keep your family in prayer. And you. Anyone else? Maxine, Phil. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I have two. Um, I want prayer for a lady named her name is Catherine Haggard, and she uh, is in the hospital in Florida, and she is a mother of a co-worker of Dan's. And the second thing is we're leaving for Mayo's in the morning, and we appreciate your prayer. So you have a safe trip, and good news. Good news, yeah. Joy. Prayers for Rita Wimmer as she's going through a medication time as well as a bladder infection. She's bleeding, and obviously she needs a stretch bladder first. And a good note, um, I spoke with Nancy Burns, and she said that her wound had healed. And she said this is the third time mm -hmm. that she's, I guess that the facility she goes to, they can ring the bell when they're uh, completely healed. And she got to do that. So prayers for her. Continue to be the husband in the morning. Yes, and praise God for the healing of this one. <coughs> Anyone else? Press. Uh, I've been blessed. My uh, daughter showed up last week in Florida. I haven't seen her in a couple of years, and she made it from a, a long birthday. <laughs> it's Thursday, and the families showed up. Sister showed up out of a lot of good calls. It was just, it was a blessing. And I really enjoyed it. I ate too much. I mean, I ain't telling you. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good. God is there. Praise God. That is a blessing. Thanks. Sherry. The Hoovers are glad to be back in Hannah. Mm -hmm. And we, we brought the back the warm weather. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and we're glad to have you back. Denise. Um, Carol Ames' granddaughter, Laura, I, I always call her Laura Ames, or she's married now, so her name's different, but she actually called me this morning and said she needs prayers, and she just said it's unspoken. So we're really excited for her. Prayers for Laura Ames, who's not Ames. Anyone else? No, Sandy. Uh, prayers for Sue Brinker, who recently lost her husband. Prayers for Sue Brinker, who recently lost her husband. Ed. We saw Casey Dyer yesterday. She got out of the hospital and is doing well and said thank you for everyone for your prayers. Glad to hear that. For the prayers for her healing. She still has a long way to go, though. Mm -hmm. So, but it sounds like progress. Yeah. So we'll take that. Yes. <coughs> Anyone else? Phil. Uh, just thank you for you missionaries that went down there and you did a big work. And so uh, thank you, missionaries, for what you've done. You, you gave to the Lord. Thank you. Well, thank you for your thanks. It was a privilege and a blessing. So, um, I can't wait for the next trip. Um, anything else? All right, then let us take all of these things to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, come to you this morning. There are people in our lives, in our communities, in our hearts who need your loving care, who need healing, who need presence, who need peace. We thank you, Lord, that your spirit goes before us. We thank you, Lord, that your grace is always present. 
we thank you that we can always lean on your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to be instruments of your peace, going to where you would have us go, sitting, talking, eating, sharing, to all whom you would call us to minister to. And we thank you, Lord, for all of the joys and the celebrations that we have in our lives. Help us, Lord, to celebrate those things with spiritual joy, with glad hearts, proclaiming to all the world how good you are in our lives. We know, Lord, that we fall short of what you would ask us to be. We fail to be obedient to your will. And we carry our own agendas and our own biases. Forgive us, Lord, and give us hearts of love that go out into the world to show your love, your grace, your good news to the least and the last and the lost. We have a tendency to want to judge. Remind us, Lord, that you alone are judge. That our role is to tell our story. We thank you, Lord, for your ever presence in our story. Help us, Lord, to share it freely, not just with our words, but with our deeds, with our actions and our attitudes, that we might reflect the good news of Jesus Christ in all that we do, say, and all that we are. We praise you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our only hope for forgiveness, who is our only hope for victory, was our only hope. And so we will join our voices together as his people, praying as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now as Carol comes forward to share with us the scripture this morning, let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive the word of God. Good morning. Good morning. The reading is from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the believers, who in Judah heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why do you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? And then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, it was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men, sent us to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel, angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. 
And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, The God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carol. Please pray with me. May your spirit speak to us this morning, O Lord. May your spirit open our minds and our hearts. And may your spirit lead us forth from here in the power of your word for the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. In our scripture this morning, we have Peter being confronted by some other believers in Jerusalem for his unlawful act of eating with Gentiles. The Bible was very clear the Jewish people were not allowed to even enter the home of a Gentile. You could do business and commerce with a Gentile, but you could not do anything communal, anything that would create bonds of friendship and family, like eating, going into their house. It was forbidden by Scripture. So these believers in Jerusalem who confront Peter about this, they've got a very valid point. So just hold on to that for a moment. In the early church, all the way up to today, Christians struggle with the question of authority. Where do we get, where do we place our authority? What authority are we under? Now we know that all authority comes from God, but you and I, Peter and those believers in Jerusalem, we have to clearly hear what God is saying. And God and God's wisdom has given us several vehicles for that authoritative work. And this scripture this morning is actually about how complex that can be. In the early church, very quickly, almost immediately, the apostles were seen as the authorities in the church. Peter, Peter's one of the apostles. Peter is the chief apostle. And even he was questioned. If any human were to have an authoritative voice other than Jesus, it would have been Peter. But it wasn't that simple for those believers in Jerusalem who were confused because Peter's actions didn't agree with how they understood Scripture. And when confronted, Peter tells the story of the dream that he had where the Holy Spirit <clears throat> gave him this vision of accepting all, clean and unclean, if they will believe. And he knew that this vision from the Holy Spirit had authority because those Gentiles received the Holy Spirit just like the first disciples did on Pentecost Day. So we have in this story three sources of authority. We have Scripture, we have the Apostles, and we have the Holy Spirit. Ideally, those three will always be seen to agree. But because Apostles are people, and because people 
are the ones that hear the Holy Spirit, the message can get a little muddled. And we can turn to Scripture, but it's clear that sometimes the simple word of Scripture isn't going to guide us correctly. Otherwise, Peter was in the wrong. But Peter was not in the wrong. It's not simple to sort out the authorities of Scripture, the apostolic teaching, and the Holy Spirit revealing things to our hearts. Thank God for His grace. But it's been such a challenge. There's a couple of things I want to highlight from the history of the church. In the years and centuries after Jesus rose into heaven, the apostles became very authoritative. They were the authorities. And the apostles, well, the original apostles, they didn't live forever on earth. So they passed on their teaching and their authority to people that came after them. And they did this by laying on hands in prayer. And they believed that the authority of the Holy Spirit passed from apostle to apostle to apostle. This, these days, we call those apostles bishops. And in certain traditions, like the Roman Catholic tradition, the Episcopalian Church, the Orthodox Churches, they believe that there is an unbroken line from their bishops today back to the original apostles. And that's why they place so much authority in their bishops. Now, we United Methodists have people that we call bishops. They're not the same kind of bishop. We don't claim that apostolic authority. In fact, our bishops only have one power. They have a lot of influence, but only one power. And that is the power to appoint pastors. Other than that, a bishop has no authority whatsoever. As a pastor under appointment, I can tell you that that one authority is plenty. But it makes some sense. There was a uh, early, he wasn't actually a bishop, but he was a teacher of the church, a man named Tertullian. And Tertullian had been taught the faith by a man named Irenaeus. And Irenaeus had been taught the faith by a man named Polycarp. And Polycarp had been taught the faith by a man named John. John the Apostle. The early church recognized that if Tertullian is going to speak, he has some authority because he is the great grand apostle of John. If John taught his teacher who taught his teacher who taught his teacher, surely that teaching can be relied upon. Well, Tertullian learned of a sect of Christians who went by the name Montanus because they followed the teachings of a man named Montanus. And they weren't really heretics. They believed the same things everyone else did. But they practiced their faith a little differently. And then for the Montanists, they believed that the Holy Spirit spoke to individuals with authority. And that those individuals didn't have to be bishops in that apostolic succession. They didn't have to be in the hierarchy of the church. And the Montanists sect in their assemblies, somebody would stand up and say, the Holy Spirit says to me, and they would give a teaching, or they would give a practice that we should do. And somebody else would stand up and say, and the Holy Spirit says to me, this is what we should do. And the Montanists believed that every person who spoke in the name of the Holy Spirit was speaking with the authority of God. And they were very egalitarian because the Holy Spirit spoke to almost all of them. 
And I can perhaps see the problem there. If Maxine says the Holy Spirit told her that we should turn and go south, and Sherry says, no, the Holy Spirit tells me that we should go west, what do you do? So it's no surprise the Montanists didn't last very long. But were they wrong? Does not the Holy Spirit speak to us and guide us? And does not the Holy Spirit speak for the Father and the Son? And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit can never disagree because they are one. But the problem is, maybe Maxine heard the Holy Spirit correctly. Or maybe Sherry heard the Holy Spirit correctly. Or maybe... It was actually Jeff who was hearing the Holy Spirit, and he didn't stand up and say anything, and we were supposed to go east. It's not simple. And we can turn to Scripture as our authority. And indeed, Martin Luther in the Reformation used the Latin phrase sola scriptura, which means only Scripture. And Martin Luther was not right. Pardon me, Martin Luther was not wrong. But the people that followed Martin Luther took it a little too far sometimes. <laughs> Such that they tried to live by the absolute letter of every word of Scripture. But even in Scripture, we find that there are disagreements. Peter and these disciples from Jerusalem, Peter and Paul, Paul and James, Peter and James, they didn't agree. Martin Luther said that if he could throw out the book of James from the Bible, he would, because the book of James talks about the importance of good works. It says faith without works is dead. And Martin Luther really wanted the only message to be we are saved by faith alone. But then there's this troublesome book of James that talks about if you don't have works, you don't have faith. For Martin Luther, that muddied the message. But then John Wesley said that James was his favorite book because it talked about the importance of works to faith. To authorities, millions upon millions of Christians today follow the teachings of Luther, the teachings of Wesley, the teachings of both, both Luther and West came to their conclusions based on thorough, deep knowledge of Scripture, study of Scripture, and application of Scripture. And yet they don't agree on a few points. Our Scripture this morning. Peter is in a situation where he's having to deal with interpretation of Scripture, the guidance of the Holy Spirit coming together in his own apostolic authority. But the Scripture doesn't tell us whether the disciples in Jerusalem accepted Peter's witness or not. Because that's the difficult part about authority in the faith is there's an authority that each and every one of us has. Because we are the authority on what authority, what authorities we will listen to. We try to live biblically. We try to follow the teachings of the church throughout the ages. We try to hear and heed the Holy Spirit. But you and I, we do fall short. <clears throat> we do the best we can, and we come up with the best, the best that we have. And yet, someone else will come to a different conclusion. And yet, someone else will come to another conclusion. <clears throat> and we can say, but only one of us is right. But how do we know? We appeal to scripture, the apostolic authority of the church, and the 
Holy Spirit, and we still wind up with disagreements. But the message of the vision that Peter had is that if anybody has accepted Christ, if anybody has accepted Christ, they are acceptable to us. Doesn't mean they're right. Then again, it doesn't mean we're right. It doesn't mean I'm right. What it means is that in the Spirit, we are one. In the Spirit, we are united with Christ. And Christ gave his life for sinners. He gave his life for sinners like you and me. He gave his life for sinners out there who have not yet given their lives to Christ. The ultimate of all, in my view, it's just my opinion, but the ultimate authority in my view is that which leads us to love God and neighbor. That which leads us out into the world proclaiming the good news because we know the good news. When we live in the world with the joy of a life transformed, the assurance of our place in God's kingdom, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, All the things that would divide us, all the things that make us unclean. Notice I use the word us, unclean. All of that pales in comparison to the gift of Christ on the cross. And because Christ gave his life for us, because he rose into heaven with God, he was able to send the Holy Spirit to us that we might have power. Not the power to be right. Not the kind of power that's authoritative, but the kind of power that can touch another person's life and heart. The kind of power that can give someone hope like Boyd found hope a few weeks ago. The kind of power that can take those who are dead inside and make them live in Christ. The kind of power that can overcome all the barriers and all the differences. The kind of power that God displayed in Christ, that God displayed on Pentecost Sunday. That kind of power, that is the authority. We need to do our best to learn the scriptures and follow them. We need to do our best to understand the historic teaching of the church, the apostolic authority. We need to do our best to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us and guiding us. But in all of that doing our best, I absolutely guarantee you that we're going to be wrong a lot of the time. That we're going to be confused much of the time. But if we put Christ first, and if we put Christ's mission of going to the lost as our mission, then all of the disagreements and the arguments and the confusion don't matter so much. We live and call this week. Let us put our lives under the authority of the God revealed in Scripture, of the God preached and proclaimed throughout the centuries in the church, of the God who touches our very hearts by the Holy Spirit. The authority is God's and God's alone. Let us follow. Let us trust, and most of all, let us love. And now, <coughs> let us celebrate. Because of all that Christ 
did for us. That we might find our lives in God forever and ever. We can celebrate the good news of the authority of God. Because Christ knew that this Christian way of life <clears throat> because Jesus knew how his very followers, his 12 closest, struggled trying to follow him. He gave us a meal. He invited his friends, not just in the upper room on that night, but he invited his friends today. He invites us to come to the table and share a meal with him and of him. Because he is our true friend. And we need strength, and we need support, and we need forgiveness, and we need grace. And the cup and the bread are not mere symbols but they are Christ's promise of his presence with us, even now. So let us take a moment and think to ourselves all the ways that we need Jesus, that we need to feed upon his broken body and be sustained by his shed blood. For the task that he calls us to do. The good news is that Christ did not invite us to this table because we have attained all that he intends for us. The good news is that Christ invites us to this table because we're not there yet, because we need spiritual nourishment, because we need community, and because we need to put ourselves under his authority. So give thanks to God that the only requirement to come to the table is that we need Jesus, and we need Jesus now. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You have opened your kingdom to people of all nations and stations of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He gives living water to quench our spiritual thirst. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for you, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, shared it with his disciples and said, Take, eat, <clears throat> this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, shared it with his disciples and said, Drink <clears throat> of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it 
remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, that through this the world may know the meaning of love. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Will those assisting with communion please come forward? The table has been prepared. The prayer of grace has been prayed. You are all invited to come and feast with and upon the Lord, that you might be sustained for the difficult journey that we are called to live. Come, receive. <laughs>
let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Make us be for the world a living example of love. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And know that our feast is not yet complete. We will have three teams going out to extend the table to those who could not be here today. So this afternoon, remain connected to this meal because it's not over until you all here. Let us now rise and sing our final hymn, Spirit of the Living God. Melting us, sending us, not to be authorities, but to be witnesses. Witnesses to what God is doing in our lives. To the victory that we have found, to the hope that we have, and to the love into which we live. So go in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, with the authority of God behind you, authorizing you to love the world. As Christ loved the world. Amen and have a blessed week.